Destiny of a Savior by Famous Fault Chapter 18 Malfoy Manor Everyone, in one or another aspect of their life, told themselves that they were an idiot. That was exactly what Harry was thinking then and there. The broadcast had hardly come to an end when he spoke Voldemort's name. He knew it was the mere habit of saying it that had made him say it. Yes, Del. Now they were sitting there. A frightened Penelope Clearwater, Barney Weasley with a broken nose, and a stung Vernon Dudley, tied to two other prisoners. Anyone still got a wand? Vernon Dudley asked. No, Barney Weasley and Penelope Clearwater said it simultaneously. This is all my fault. I said the name. I'm sorry. Vernon Dudley started to apologize, ready to crawl on his knees and to beg for forgiveness if that was what his friends wanted. Harry? A familiar voice asked, clearly shocked. Dean? Harry asked, even more surprised. It really gives you. If they find out who you are. Dean fell silent for a second and started to explain that they were Snatchers. It took the Snatchers about five minutes to find out that his name was not Vernon Dudley. Not much later, they were standing in front of the Malfoy Manor. Narcissa Malfoy let them in with a skeptical expression after Scabior, one of the Snatchers, ensured her it really was Harry, although his face was swollen. Draco will be able to tell if it is him, she sighed and led the way. What is this? The drawling voice of Lucius Malvoy asked as he stood up. They say they have got Potter, Narcissa's cold voice said as a loud scream came from underneath Harry's feet, a scream of pure agony. Narcissa closed her eyes at the sound, then regained focus. Draco, come here, she ordered. Harry did not look Draco in the eyes, but as another scream tore through the building, he saw Draco shiver and clench his fists. Clearly, the screams were affecting the blonde Slytherin. Harry vaguely recalled that he himself had screamed like that. Wait, no, he hadn't. Those memories weren't really his. Professor Muto's spirit had created them. Harry shivered in his turn. Nonetheless, the screams were horrible. Well, bye. An impatient Greyback rasped. Draco approached slowly. Every time one of those screams were heard in the room, a shudder went through the boy. Looking around, Harry noticed that the only ones not affected were the Snatchers. Draco did his best to shake it off, as he looked at Harry with a fearful expression. Well, Draco, is it? Is it Harry Potter? Lucius asked eagerly. To Harry's surprise, Draco answered, I can't... I can't be sure... He did his very best not to look at Harry. The effort he put into it was equal as the effort Harry put into not looking at Draco. One tail! Narcissa Malfoy yelled as yet another scream shook them all before being interrupted suddenly by God knew what. Harry wasn't sure that he wanted to know. Tell my sister to stop! None of us can function when we have to listen to his screaming every day. Tell her to come here. She'll enjoy this just as much. Harry felt the cold hand around his heart tighten its grip. Bellatrix Lestrange, the woman that had killed his godfather. Who was she torturing? Whoever it was, Harry felt truly sorry for him. Being submitted to the mercy of Bellatrix Lestrange seemed like a fate crueler than death. Lucius urged Draco to come closer, but the more his parents pushed, the more uncertain his answers became. Even when Narcissa turned towards Hermione, Draco's answers were avoiding. Yes, I suppose it could be her. The two elder Malfoys did, however, not need their son's confirmation to recognize Ron and Hermione. Then Bellatrix entered, and Harry noticed that the screaming had stopped. Considering Bellatrix's lack of conscience, the chance that whoever she had been torturing was dead was greater than the chance he was not. What is this? What is going on, sissy? She asked in her baby voice and started to circle around the prisoners. Then she caught sight of Hermione. Well, well, isn't that the mudblood girl, Granger? Yes, yes it is, Granger, Lucius said, his voice excited. And with her, the Weasley boy and Potter, we got Potter. Potter! Balletrix shrieked and laughed. Then the Dark Lord must be informed at once. The cold hand around his heart threatened to break it. Harry was sick with worry and fear. He had been so stupid, so immensely stupid. He had known the name was tabooed, so why had he spoken it? He had been a giant idiot, and now they were in this position. Then, after a small argument amongst the Death Eaters on who got to summon the Dark Lord, Bellatrix suddenly caught sight of something. Stop! She yelled loudly. If we summon the Dark Lord now, we will perish! She had caught sight of the sword. The sword of Godric Gryffindor. What is that? 
she asked the snatcher who was holding it. Sword was the clever answer she received. She demanded that it was given to her, but the snatchers did not obey. Big mistake. Nobody disobeyed Bellatrix the Strange. She stunned them all, except for Greyback. Where did you find the sword? It was supposed to be in my vault at Gringotts. Snape sent it now. Bellatrix was nearly hysterical. Harry had never seen her like that before. It frightened him. Bellatrix the Strange was frightening at all times, but this surpassed the usual. In their tent! Greyback called out and sprang to his feet when Bellatrix released him from the spell she had put on him. Draco, take this scum outside! If you are too much of a coward to finish them yourselves, then leave them in the courtyard for me to finish! She barked at Draco, walking around hysterically. Don't you dare speak to Draco like... Narcissa said furiously, but Bellatrix screamed, Be quiet! The situation is graver than you can possibly imagine, sissy! We have a very serious problem! She stood panting slightly, looking down at the sword, examining its hilt. Then she turned to look at the silent prisoners. If it is indeed Potter, he must not be harmed, she muttered, more to herself than to the others. The Dark Lord wishes to dispose of Potter himself, but if he finds out, I must... I must know! She turned back to her sister again. The prisoners must be placed in the cellar while I think of what to do. This is my house, Bella. You don't give orders in my... Damn it! You have no idea of the danger we're in! Bellatrix shrieked. She looked frightening, mad. A thin stream of fire issued from her wand and burned a hole in the carpet. Narcissa hesitated for a moment, then addressed the werewolf. Take these prisoners down to the cellar, Greyback. What? Bellatrix said sharply. All except... Except for the mud blood. Greyback gave a grunt of pleasure. No! Ron shouted... Me, keep me! Bellatrix hit him across the face. The blow echoed around the room. If she dies under questioning, I'll take you next, she said. Blood Trader is next to my blood in my book. Take them downstairs, Greyback, and make sure they are secure. But do nothing more to them. Yet. She threw Greyback's wand back to him, then took a short silver knife from under her robes. She cut Hermione free from the other prisoners, then dragged her by the hair into the middle of the room, while Greyback forced the rest of them to shovel across to another door into a dark passageway, his wand held out in front of him, projecting an invisible and irresistible force. Rackard should let me have a bit of the girl when she's finished with him. Greyback crooned as he forced them along the corridor. I'd say, I'm gonna buy the two, wouldn't you, Ginger? Harry could feel Ron shaking. They were forced down a steep flight of stairs, still tied back to back and in danger of slipping and breaking their necks at any moment. At the bottom was a heavy door. Greybuck unlocked it with the top of his wand, then forced them into a dank and musty room and left them in total darkness. The echoing bang of the slammed cellar door had not died away before there was a terrible, drawn-out scream from directly above them. Hermione! Ron screamed, and Harry could have sworn he'd go deaf from the loudness of Ron's voice. Be quiet, Harry said. We need to work out, but Ron did not listen. Hermione! Hermione! Harry? Ron? Someone asked, effectively making Ron go quiet. Luna? Harry asked, all upon recognizing the dreamy voice. Yes, it's me! Oh no, I didn't want you to get caught. Luna, can you help us get these ropes off? Harry asked. Oh yes, I expect so. There's an old nail we use if we need to break anything. Just a moment. Hermione screamed again from overhead, and they could hear Bellatrix screaming too, but her words were inaudible, for Ron shouted again, Hermione! Hermione! Please, make him go quiet. Luna said more forcefully than usual, He does not often get peace. Grant him these minutes of calmness. Harry elbowed Ron in the side as much as he could while tied up. He was about to ask Luna who she meant, but she was already gone to get the nails she had mentioned. When she returned, he could feel her work on the fibers of the rope. You have to stay still, Luna said. I can't see what I am doing. More than them and Ron said. It is in my pocket. I'm filled with light. A few seconds later, a soft click was heard, and several orbs of light entered the basement. Unable to return to their sources, they just hung on various spots against the ceiling. Harry looked around himself, and the first thing he saw was the motionless form of the wand-maker, Ollivander. He was dirty and thin, but breathing. Luna herself looked a bit tired, but otherwise unscathed. Grapook the goblin was ready to pass out, and the only thing that made it that he was still standing were the ropes tying him to the other three. Dean looked, like Luna, tired, but his face was bloody and bruised. 
And then there was the figure at the center of the floor. Harry gasped for breath. Is he alive? He could not help but ask. Luna looked the way Harry was looking and nodded. Yes. Beltatrix keeps him weak, but she is not allowed to kill him. She tortures him daily, sometimes several times a day. He is the one you heard screaming a couple of minutes ago. Harry found it hard to believe that the broken figure on the floor was alive. Both his legs had been broken, multiple times it seemed. Deep slashes covered his face, arms, and torso, covering his clothes in a dark red color of unmistakable origin. Sweat had covered his skin, which had a sickly pale shade, and he was covered in dust and dirt. Professor Murtaugh! Dean called out, shocked, at the sight of his former teacher. The Japanese did not react. Meanwhile, from above came Bellatrix's voice. You lying, filthy my blood, and I know it! You have been inside my vault, and Gringotts, tell the truth, tell the truth! Another terrible scream came from Hermione, and Ron, in his turn, shouted, Hermione! Please, Ron! Luna said, and threw another look at Professor Muto. Shouting will do you or Hermione any good. Give the professor some peace. As if the professor had heard Luna, he made choking noise before attempting to sit up as Luna finally broke through the fibers. Ron did not waste any time. He started looking for a way to escape at once, running around the basement, looking around wildly. Dean just thanked Luna and Griphook sank to the floor. Luna accepted the gratefulness before turning away from them and walking over to Professor Muto. Harry, please get me some water. She told him before gently pushing Professor Muto back down. Please don't sit up, Professor. You were injured. Harry fetched the water jug that was standing next to the still motionless wand maker and gave it to Luna, who used a spoon to carefully give the professor some water. The professor, although conscious, was hardly aware of his surroundings. How long has he been here? Harry asked, wondering how long a person could survive that sort of torture. Since Christmas morning. He has been here as long as I have, Luna said silently. He's barely been conscious since. They are so frightened of him that they keep him on the border of death. The only reason he is still alive is because you know who still has business with him, though I don't know what. Then she turned to Ron. There's no way out, Ron. The cellar is completely escape-proof. I tried at first. Mr. Ollivander has been here for a long time. He's tried everything. From above, more screaming came, and Harry cringed as if the screaming was a witness to his own pain. Ron was pounding the walls with his fists, almost sobbing as he did so. Hermione! Ron screamed again. What else did you take? Answer me! God now! Bellatrix yelled, and the words were followed up by yet another scream from Hermione. The professor, at the noise around him, once again tried to sit up, and when Luna tried to urge him down again, he pushed her away. She hardly felt it, but she did not try to push him down again. What's going on? He asked as he came to a semi sitting position, leaning painfully on his damaged arms. Professor! Dean said and came to a crouch next to the former teacher. The large amethyst eyes met those of Dean, and the professor sighed as he recognized the face of the teenager next to him. Dean, he whispered, you shouldn't be here. Who else is here? Harry noticed that the professor spoke slowly, as if it was hurting him. It would not be a surprise. Luna gave him some more water, which he accepted gratefully. Harry and Ron are here too, and Griphook, Luna said. They came here just today. Uh, Bellatrix? He asked, but did not need an answer as yet another one of Hermione's screams echoed through the manor. I see, he sighed. Who is it? Hermione or Tracy? Hermione. Harry said, his voice cracking as he said the name of one of his best friends. He did, however, not miss the look that passed over Dean's face at the mention of his girlfriend, and Harry realized that Dean probably did not know what had happened to Tracy. She's alive, he said, turning towards Dean. She was injured, but she was recovering. Dean exhaled while above the torture continued. How did you get into my vault? They heard a Bellatrix scream. Did they we only met him tonight, Hermione sobbed. We've never been inside your vault. It isn't the real sword. It's a copy. Just a copy. A copy! Bellatrix screeched. Oh, a luckily story! 
But we can find out easily, came Lucius's voice. Draco, fetch the goblin. He can tell us whether the sword is real or not. Luna hurled up at once, taking the water jug and placing it next to Ollivander and said, They'll kill us if they know we help him. Luna whispered to Harry, Bellatrix will kill anyone who interferes. They could hear someone scuttling on the cellar steps. Next moment, Draco's shaking voice spoke from behind the door. Stand back! Line up against the back wall! Don't try anything or I'll kill you! Harry bent down to help Professor Muto do as they were ordered, but Luna prevented him. Don't! They do not see him as a threat. We will only harm him more if we try to move him. Professor Muto nodded a little in silent agreement before his arms gave up and he fell back to the floor. He did not move again. Harry and the rest did as they were ordered, and Ron called the orbs of light back into his deluminator, and the darkness was restored. It was, however, soon disrupted again as Malfoy opened the cellar door, and light from above flooded into the cellar. He had his wand outstretched, ready to curse whoever made a move. Then his eyes fell upon Professor Muto, who really did look more dead than alive, and he did a double take. For a couple of seconds he was frozen to the spot, and he frowned. Harry had never seen that expression on Malfoy's face before. It spoke of doubt and confusion, but also of pity, and for some odd reason, guiltiness. Professor, are you awake? He asked, to everyone's great surprise. He had, however, still his wand aimed at them, so nobody moved. Harry was not sure what surprised him more, the question, or that Malfoy still called Yugi Moto for Professor. A small, sad smile fluttered across the teacher's bloody face. Barely. Why? Malvoy started, and his voice cracked. He started anew. Why did you lie to me? Harry listened closely. He had no idea what Malfoy was referring to. But it certainly was an interesting spectacle. Dean, Luna, and Ron also had their attention on the scene before them. Although, every now and then, Ron would close his eyes and clench his fists when Hermione screamed. Malvoy also winced, more affected by the screaming than he was willing to admit. Harry recalled his second year, when he and Ron had turned themselves into Crab and Goyle. Malvoy had, with a horrible smile, said that he hoped that if a mudblood were to die at the hands of the basilisk, it would be Hermione. Harry had always wondered if that had been sincere or simple big talk. Now he had his answer. Professor Muto also noticed Malfoy's reactions. He did, not, however, not comment on them. Instead, he just answered the question. I told you what I wanted to believe myself. I lied. Because I had the one thing I had desired for all these years within my reach, but could not go through with it. I simply can't kill but you are no coward! Why can't you kill? Malvoy asked, desperate for answers, and Harry could not bring himself to hate his rival then and there. He was just like him, a normal boy caught up in things he did not want. Mr. Malvoy, Professor Muto sighed, why do you find me brave? Malfoy looked even more confused than before, and shook his head as if it would make things fall into place. Because, because you never back down. You saved Tracy Davis when Umbridge tried to kill her. You broke into the ministry to save your spirit. You showed up at Dumbledore's funeral, even though you knew what people would think of you. You... You went to Azkaban. I was the witch or wizard that does not fear Azkaban. Yet you went there willingly in order to free the Muggleborns. I don't know anyone that brave. So I don't understand. If you can do all that, why can't you kill? All those things you just mentioned, Professor Muto said, and his weak voice witnessed of the effort speaking was for him. I did them all for people I care about, people I want to protect. When I do something for someone I care about, I am not afraid, because that love I feel overpowers the fear. My hatred does not. I can't hate enough to kill and risk the consequences, but when it is to protect those I care for, the consequences don't matter. I can give my life for love, but never kill for hatred. The professor smiled some more, with unseeing eyes, which he closed with a sigh. 
Then he slowly opened them again to look at Malfoy. Malfoy shook his head again, not to dismiss the words Professor Muto had said, but because he tried to comprehend them. I know what he did to them. I know what Dad did. He's still my dad, but had I been you, I can't imagine not killing him. I still don't understand. I think you do, Professor Muto said, and another small smile fluttered across his lips, only to turn into a grimace as yet another of Hermione's screams reached his ears. From above, the voices of Lucius and Narcissa Malfoy were growing impatient. Why else would you have asked me that? You can't kill either. And that really makes me happy. It is a disgrace, Malfoy opposed him. No. No, the professor said, falling silent to gather some strength. The inability to kill is a sign of purity, innocence, and light. It can force one down the hard road at times, but mostly it makes life a bit easier, a bit happier. It means that you are a good person, Draco. Professor Muto added, surprising Malfoy with a sudden use of his first name. Not that I ever doubted that. You were simply deeply misguided. Perhaps once I'll ask you who changed your course. The professor's voice was dying away, slowly. Harry could have sworn the professor had just spoken his last words. Then suddenly Dobby appeared. Harry was certain Malfoy would curse the elf, but the blonde boy seemed paralyzed from the words that he had just been told. Rebecca, he whispered. Harry did not understand, but he frankly did not care. He was still waiting for a reaction from Malfoy on Dobby. When the blonde looked up again, Harry hardly recognized him. His gaze was ripped and torn and hurt. Then he looked at Harry, straight in the eyes, having made up his mind. I still hate you! Draco said Harry felt his insides grow cold. He and Malfoy had a whole history they shared, a history that surpassed their lives. Harry had far from forgotten the events that had only happened in his mind, events that had taken place during a war, events that had shown Malfoy's true self. Malfoy might not recall him, but certainly he could feel them. Then Malfoy went on. But that has nothing to do with this. The elf should be able to get you out of here. Stun me and leave! But Hermione, Ron protested as yet another set of screams floated down from the stairs. You will only increase casualties if you try to save her. Just get out, Drago urged, nearly hysteric. Then Professor Ramuto's words came to his mind, and Harry could almost see that Malfoy was beating himself up over once again, refusing to see the meaning of those words. God damn it! Fine! But it won't help! We don't need your help, Ron said angrily, but Harry put a calming hand on his friend's shoulder. Even he realized that this was no time to let old rivalries get the better of them. Not one of us has a wand. We'd be unable to stun you. Harry explained calmly, not quite sure if any of this was really happening. Malfoy clutched his head, then gave a silent sort of scream. Then to Harry's great surprise, Malfoy tossed him his wand. Here, you can have it. Now, Mullatrix, will at least stop telling me to kill whoever she wants dead. Harry caught the wand and looked at Malfoy abashed. Malfoy did, however, not feel like wasting any time. Neither did Ron. Stole him! Ron said as Hermione screamed. Harry hesitated a second, but when Draco nodded, Harry stunned him. The wand did as he told it far better than a stranger's wand should, and Harry looked at it surprised. Malfoy hit the ground next to Professor Muto. Then he turned to Dobby. Dobby, take Dean, Luna, Mr. Ollivander, Griphook, and Professor Muto out of here. Bring them. Show cottage, Ron said. Dobby nodded, his ears flapping less than they would have due to the heavy earrings, the gift from the man on the floor. Then come back for Ron, Hermione, and me, Harry added, and Dobby kept nodding. Dean and Luna both started to protest, but Harry would not listen. Go, we will see you at Bill and Fleur's. Unfortunately, Malfoy is right. We might just increase the amount of us who will not survive. Just go. Dean and Luna exchanged a glance, then took Dobby's outstretched fingers. Then a split second before Dobby apparated, Dean removed his hands. Harry swore at Dirty Dean. Why did you do that? The last thing I saw of Tracy was going back ripping her to shreds. Had you not told me otherwise, I would have thought she was dead. That savage will answer to me for what he has done. You aren't the only one with the girl to rescue. Harry wanted to protest more, but Ron simply nodded. Then they heard footsteps coming their way. Ron dashed forth to close the door before anyone noticed it was open. 
Harry could tell from the way the footsteps shuffled that it was Wormtail. It's Wormtail. We're going to have to try to tackle him, he whispered to Ron and Dean. They had no choice. The moment anyone entered the room and saw the absence of the majority of the prisoners, they were lost. Leave the lights on, Harry added. And as they heard someone descending the steps outside the door, they blacked against the wall on either side of it. Stand back, came Wormtail's voice, just as Harry had predicted. Stand away from the door. I'm coming in. The door flew open. For a split second, Wormtail gazed into the basement, seeing no one else but Draco, ablaze with light from the three miniature suns floating in midair. Then Harry and Ron launched themselves upon him. Dean stayed back so he would be able to have an overview of the situation and come to their aid when they needed. Ron seized Wormtail's warmed arm and forced it upwards. Harry slapped a hand to his mouth, muffling his voice. Silently, they struggled. Wormtail's wand emitted sparks. His silver hand closed around Harry's throat. What is it, Wormtail? Lucius Malfoy called from above. Nothing! Ron called back, in a passable imitation of Wormtail's wheezy voice. Oh, fine! Harry could barely breathe. Dean came to his rescue, doing his very best to make Wormtail let go. But the man simply shoved Dean out of the way. You're going to kill me! Harry choked, attempting to prise off the metal fingers. After I saved your life, you owe me, Wormtail! The silver finger slackened. Harry had not expected it. He wrenched himself free, astonished, keeping his hand over Wormtail's mouth. He saw the rat-like man's small, watery eyes widen with fear and surprise. He seemed just as shocked as Harry at what his hand had done, at the tiny, merciful impulse it had betrayed, and he continued to struggle more powerfully, as though to undo that moment of weakness. Oh, we'll have that, Ron whispered, tucking Wormtail's wand from his other hand. Wandless, helpless, Peter Cruz pupils dilated in terror. His eyes had slid from Harry's face to something else. His own silver fingers were moving inexorably towards his own throat. No! Without pausing to think, Harry tried to drag back the hand, but there was no stopping it. The silver tool that Voldemort had given his most cowardly servant had turned upon its disarmed and useless owner. Pettigrew was reaping his reward for his hesitation, his moment of pity. He was being strangled before their eyes. No! Ron had released Wormtail, too, and together he and Harry tried to pull the crushing metal fingers from around Wormtail's throat. My God! Dean whispered, and also tried to pull the metal fingers away. But it was no use. Pettigrew was turning blue. We lost you! Ron said, pointing the wand at the silver hand, but nothing happened. Pettigrew dropped to his knees, and at the same moment, Hermione gave a dreadful scream from overhead. Wormtail's eyes rolled upward in his purple face. He gave a last twitch, and was still. Dean gasped in amazement. What just happened? He asked, then shook his head. Never mind. Let's go. Without any more delay, Harry, Ron, and Dean ran up the stairs. Harry understood that Dean probably wondered about Pettigrew, but that story was for later, if they survived. Harry really hoped they did. There were enough questions he still wanted to answer on, preferably before he died. The door to the drawing room, where Bellatrix was torturing Hermione, stood ajar, and Harry had to keep Ron from running in there like a madman and be killed. They approached carefully, listening closely. It's just a fake. They heard Hermione sob. A fake. Then she screamed once again, a loud, terrible scream. Where is Draco with a damn goblin? Lucius hissed, though Harry could hear the tone of worry underneath the annoyance. Malvo had been gone far longer than he should have been, and Harry knew it would not take long before someone else present would go check why neither Draco nor Wormtail had returned. Harry heard Dean whisper in Harry's ear. Do you trust me? Harry nodded. Give me Malfoy's wand, just for now. You'll see why. Harry frowned, but did not question the Gryffindor. Instead, he handed Dean the wand. Bellatrix sighed. It looks like I have to do everything myself. I think we can dispose of the mud-blooded Greyback. You can take her if you want. Ron stopped. No! He yelled, and without thinking, stormed into the drawing room. Before anyone present could react, Ron bellowed, Expelling Ormus! And Bellatrix's wand flew through the air to Harry's outstretched hand. Harry had, without thinking any more than Ron, followed his red-haired friend. Stupefy! Harry yelled, and Lucius Malfoy was hit square in the chest. Then, wasting no time, he ducked behind a sofa to avoid the jets of light from Greyback and Narcissa's wand. Narcissa, who had attempted to hex him on instinct, gasped when she realized the consequences of him being here and Draco not being here. Draco! She called out. What did you do to him? Nobody answered her, neither did anyone seem to care. Greyback kept attacking them, and Harry, looking around, noticed that Dean wasn't there. What the hell was he up to? Certainly Dean would not chicken out. It would be very uncharacteristic of him. Stop! Or she dies! 
But the Tuxes' high voice shrieked. She was supporting an unconscious Hermione and held a silver dagger against her throat. Drop your wands! I'll see exactly how filthy her blood is! Harry and Ron did the only thing they could in the situation. They dropped their obtained wands and raised their hands. Harry started to realize why Dean had not yet appeared. He was waiting for a more favorable moment. Harry supposed they had to be lucky one of them had been thinking before acting. He also wondered why Bellatrix had not called Voldemort yet. No, Bellatrix said softly. Sissy, I think we ought to tie these little heroes up again while Greyback takes care of Miss Mudblood. I am sure the Dark Lord will not begrudge you the girl, Greyback, after what you have done tonight. Let me go check on Draco, Narcissa Malfoy said with clenched jaw as she looked at Bellatrix, who seemed not to care about the well-being of the youngest Malfoy. Fine, fine, just hurry, Bellatrix said dismissively, and in the moment of distraction, Dean decided to act as hero. He emerged from the doorway, and with one well-aimed curse, he hit Bellatrix straight in the side, stunning her. The only people left in the room were Narcissa Malfoy and Greyback. Ron did not bother to pick up Wormtail's wand. He dashed forward, attempting to catch Hermione before she hit the ground. He did not make it in time, but fell to his knees beside her a split second later. Dean paid little attention to Narcissa, Ron, Hermione, or Harry. He walked with Draco's wand, raised toward Greyback, and disarmed the werewolf. Where is Tracy? He snapped angrily at the werewolf, who backed away slowly. She's dead, Greyback said, and bared his teeth in a horrible grin. I ate her. She's alive! Dean bit back. I know she is. Injured but alive. You failed to kill her. She'd never be killed by someone like you. Now tell me where she is. Harry had never heard his friend sound quite like that. His tone was venomously and every word was carefully pronounced, although Dean was shaking in anger. Whoever told you that, Lloyd? Greyback said, although his smile faltered a bit. I ripped out her throat and clawed at her eyes. She was delicious. She should have been one of us, but she chose to neglect us, so I killed her. Such a treacherous little werewolf. Dean sighed, realizing he would not receive an answer from Greyback. She is a loyal, brilliant, cunning, undetermined girl. She's just a bit fluffy at times. Dean shouted and struck. Having lost all patience with the werewolf, he attacked. Completely neglecting his wand, Dean surged forth and hit Greyback in the face with his fist. Then he brought up a knee into Werewolf's genitals. Greyback yelped in pain and fell to the ground. Then Dean stunned him using Malfoy's wand. Damn it! He hissed. Then both Harry and Dean turned towards Narcissa, who was the only person in the room left standing. Narcissa simply dropped her wand, did not even attempt to fight. What did you do to Draco? She asked, her voice trembling. Harry and Dean exchanged a glance. Dean just shrugged. He's in the cellar, Harry answered. He's unarmed. As for Wormtail, I'm not quite sure what happened. Then he made a small sideward movement with his head, as if giving Narcissa permission to leave. Narcissa did not hesitate. She left the drawing room, leaving her wand on the floor. Harry did not bother picking that one up, although he had Bellatrix's wand in his hand again. Then Dobby entered the room, returning like he had promised, although having taken slightly longer than Harry had counted on. Harry waved him over to where Ron and Hermione were sitting. Dobby knelt down next to Hermione and took one of her limp hands in his. Ron put a hand on Dobby's shoulder, and Dean walked towards the trio. Harry looked at everyone in the room and noticed, displeased, that Bellatrix was starting to awake. That woman really was something. Dean's stunning spell had been spot on, yet already Bellatrix was awakening. Let's hurry, Harry said as he crouched down next to Dobby. The sword! Ron said and pointed at the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Harry swore again and dashed for it. As he picked it up, he noticed that Bellatrix was coming to her feet. With a sword in his hands, he sprinted back towards the four on the ground, and he heard Bellatrix's shriek as he touched Dobby's fingers. The last thing Harry saw before Dobby dragged them into a crushing apparition was something silver coming their way. A few seconds later, they hit solid earth and smelled salty air. Harry fell to his knees, relinquished Dobby's hand. He squinted around through the darkness. There seemed to be a cottage a short way away, under the wide starry sky, and he thought he saw movement outside it. Dobby, is this shell cottage? He whispered, clutching the wand he had brought from the Malfoys, ready to fight if he needed to. Have we come to the right place? Dobby? He looked around. The little elf stood feet from him. Dobby! The elf swayed slightly, stars reflected in his wide, shining eyes. Together, he and Harry looked down at the silver hilt of the knife, protruding from the elf's heaving chest. Dobby! No! Help! 
Harry bellowed towards the cottage, toward the people moving there. Help! He did not know or care whether they were wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that a dark stain was spreading across Dobby's front, and that he had stretched out his own arms to Harry with a look of supplication. Harry caught him and laid him sideways on the cool grass. Dobby, no, don't die, don't die. The elf's eyes found him, and his lips trembled with the effort to form words. Harry? Butter? And then, with a little shudder, the elf became quite still, and his eyes were nothing more than great glassy orbs, sprinkled with light from the stars they could not see. Rebecca, since death, used to be rather calm. She wasn't now. Rio! She yelled as she attempted to find the room of requirement. There was none, which meant that Rio wasn't there. Then where the hell was he? She flew around the castle, calling Rio's name loudly. It was not the wisest of things to do. She knew that much, but panic had a grip over her that would not allow her to stop. She even entered the great hall in order to find Rio, knowing full well that if he was there, he'd be dead. Luckily, Rio wasn't there to her surprise, however. Mahad was. She did another survey of the castle, looking for the albino in common rooms, offices, dungeons, and classrooms, coming up with nothing. She had seen Rio just yesterday, so where was he now? Certainly the carols had not gotten a hold of him. She waited outside the teacher's lounge and waited for Mahad to exit. Eventually he did, alone, as always. Had she been able to, she would have hugged him. Mahad had, for some reason, been severely weakened since Christmas, and he hardly managed to find power enough to teach his classes. It was only rarely that he was seen outside the classroom. Mahad! She called out, and he reacted at once on her panicked tone. He turned towards her and frowned. Rebecca, what is wrong? It's Rio! I can't find him anywhere! She said, her voice hysteric. She did a fair attempt to calm herself, but it was of little use. She really didn't want to find out that Rio was dead, and the thought alone made all her calmness vaporize. She had seen him just yesterday in the room of requirement. She and Rio had decided to keep it down. Since he had been hit with a sectum sempra, he finally understood how dangerous it was to be out in the open. Rebecca knew that many students thought that Rio had died, but he hadn't. He had simply taken a hit and needed to retreat. It meant that they had left the student to their rates, since Mahad couldn't do anything either, weakened as he had become. But now the room of requirement was gone, and so was Rio, while Mahad was back. Calm down, Rebecca, Mahad said, and his blue eyes bore into her frightened gaze. Why have you been gone? She whispered. It's hard. It truly was hard. She was the one who had to keep her eyes and ears open and to do her best to keep her friends alive. More than once had she saved Seamus, Luna, Peter, Ginny, and Neville from serious injury by warning them for things they had not even considered. It was a full-time job, and although that changed being dead to a rather eventful state of existing, it was also emotionally draining. The screaming of the students who did not get away was equally draining. I understand that, Rebecca. I am proud of you. Mahad said and smiled. Mahad rarely smiled, and Rebecca understood that he really must be proud. Then he cast his eyes to the ground. My sudden weakness can only mean that something happened to my pharaoh. Rebecca, who should have realized that, felt her heart go cold. No! It's okay, they're alive. They're recovering now. My strength is returning, but they have been through some rough stuff. Mahad closed his eyes and tried to shrug the horrible feeling off. It was his duty to protect Pharaoh Atem, and now he could do nothing for him. And Rio? Rebecca asked. Can you find him? Mahad opened his eyes, and he had that expressionless face again. Rebecca did not like it when he looked like that, since it made him look as if he lacked emotion, which he didn't. He did not normally look like that when it was just the two of them, which meant he was hiding something. Rebecca, Mahad whispered. When is the last time you have seen a ghost, other than yourself or Peeves? The magician did not lose his expressionless mask. Rebecca opened her mouth to retort, but then realized that she could not even recall the last time she had seen a ghost. I... I don't know, she confessed. I can sense nearly no ghosts, Mahad said. I feel the Grey Lady, the Bloody Baron, and you... But that is all I feel when it comes to ghosts. Peeves is also within my range, but all the other ghosts are gone. Myrtle never leaves the bathrooms. She must be one of them. Are you certain you can't sense her? Or Sir Nicholas? Rebecca asked, disbelieving, trying to suppress the hysteric tone. Mahad shook his head. I feel no ghosts. And no real. Bakura isn't in the castle, and neither are the ghosts. They seem to have disappeared. That just can't be, 
Rebecca protested and flew off towards the bathroom where Myrtle usually resided. Myrtle wasn't there. She found the great lady and asked her if she had seen any other ghosts. But shy as she was, the ghost of Helena Ravenclaw would have been unable to answer even if she had been willing to provide Rebecca with one. Nowhere in Hogwarts, a building that tended to be filled with ghosts, did she find a single grayish-silver apparition that made out a ghost. They seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The ghosts were gone. So was Rio. Rebecca was not quite sure what caused her to worry more. Rio's disappearance or that of the ghosts. Both were a good reason to worry. When she relocated Mahad at last, she asked him on his opinion. Mahad simply shook his head. I don't know what to think, Rebecca. Ghosts don't simply disappear, and yes, you should worry. You could disappear too. You still have things to do, so I want you to stick close to me. As for you, there isn't really anything that either you or me can do for him. The only thing we can hope is that the reason I can't sense him is that he has left Hogwarts, and not the alternative. Rebecca did not want to agree, but she knew she had no choice. Yes, she whispered and looked out a window. She sincerely hoped that Rio was out there somewhere, preferably the ghosts too. Where the hell was everybody?